Hey everybody, welcome back to the series where I review RPG products and uh, flip through them and show you what they're like. In this video I'm going to be finishing up my reviews set of the Greg Gillespie Mega Dungeons. So in this one I'll be doing High Fell, The Floating Dungeon, and Duero Deep. This one is essentially a big floating island with a bunch of wizard's towers and ruins and dungeons beneath those towers. Uh, it's an old, like, floating wizard school that was destroyed by magic, and now it's just this ruin floating on a flying sky island, which is a great setup. And Duero Deep is sort of Mines of Moria. I mean, it's not even sort of, it basically just is. Instead of Duero Delph, right? It's Duero Deep. And it's, um, it's just the Mines of Moria, which is, is about as awesome or as not awesome as you think the Mines of Moria are. <laughs> because it's basically just that. With, with obviously, it's, it's not Lord of the Rings. It's, it's his own fantasy world. But it's a, a great, a great mega dungeon. I'll talk about each of them in turn. Now, these are these two are both really good. After looking at them again, I think High Fell is actually I prefer it to the uh, the, uh, the Forbidden Caverns of Archaea. But I still think Barrow Maze is my favorite. So I think we go Barrow Maze, High Fell, Archaea, and then Barrow Deep. All four are good. Again not for 5e, which is the ones that I have. Get the OS, or, uh, get the um, Labyrinth Lord versions of them. But they are good for, what, uh, even in 5e, they're good for what they are. Great ideas. I'm never going to run either of them in 5e. Again, I, I said this in the other video, that I did run this for 5e, and it didn't work. Um, and I realized, actually, I did run Barrow Maze for 5e as well. I had forgotten. We only played like three or four sessions of it because it didn't work at all. Uh, that's why it faded from my mind. Maybe even not even three. We might have only played one or two in 5e. Um, and we tried it maybe a couple times, and it didn't work out. So Barrow Maze was, the 5e experience was definitely forgettable, as was High Fell. Although High Fell wasn't forgettable in 5e because it was bad. It was actively unfun. Whereas, I think, um, if I had run them for an old school game in an old school system, it would have been way better. But anyway, I'll talk more about that as we go through. I'm going to start with High Fell. High Fell is the, um, again, this floating wizard school, and um, as you can see, the cover is bizarre. They're fighting this monster. It's like a dragon, sort of. And that's one of the big bads. He's, he's, he's in one of the dungeons. He's uh, kind of uh, a big threat that you can unleash or run into, uh, but you're not likely to fight him all the time. Uh, it's not a villain-centric adventure or campaign or something. He's not the main big bad. Or anything like that, um, of like the, a standard story. Is again, just like Barrow Maze, just like Archaea, this is a site based encounter, or it's a site based mega dungeon, I should say, and um, site based adventure. And so, what you have is not, you know, you don't have these, uh, this, this overarching story. Although, this one has something going on that you can try to inter interfere with or interrupt. Um, so anyway, here's the front cover, back cover. And then let's get into it a little bit. So once again, the art is incredible. Presentation is very similar to what we've seen elsewhere. There's the floating island and the players going up to it uh, on, you know, griffins or something like that. Um, one of the challenges of this mega dungeon is finding ways up to the floating island. You start as level one characters, you can't just cast fly. So how do you get up there? Uh, there's an introduction, a brief history of the region, and the Gazetteer. And so it's pretty standard in that sense, a great piece of art for the floating island, the waterfalls coming off of it, the ruins up there. Um, several of the locations in the region. Here's a map of the the, uh, the region itself. Now something that someone in the um, on the other videos told me in the chat, uh, in, the, uh, in the comments section, and I didn't know this until I looked at it, at it, and I, and I went and confirmed it, absolutely it's true. All of the maps of all of these Mega Dungeons fit onto the map of the original outdoor survival board game, which was the original, you know, hex crawl that they used uh, back in the day, when they very, when the very, very uh, began, first started playing D&D in its first forms, they used the outdoor survival board game as the overland hex crawl. Um, all of these maps actually fit into it. I mean, like the, the terrain is the same as different parts of those maps, so you can just map it right onto that whole book. So if you have Outdoor Survival um, and that map, you can just uh, um, you can just play it on that. You can admit, you can give that to your players. Be like, here's the region of the north, and here are all the, here's the central city. 
which is detailed in one of the other books, and uh, in uh, Duero Div, actually. Or not detailed, but, but indicated and, and re referred to and talked about a bit. Um, and uh, here are all the regions and the Mega Dungeons associated. So you could put it all in one big world on one map and have that. I don't know who would run all of these in one campaign for the same group, but maybe it's not one campaign for the same group. Maybe it's a series of Mega Dungeons and you're doing it for Big West Marches. That would be awesome. Like if you're like a game store and you had like an open night where there are like, you know, three DMs who run uh, different parts of the dungeons and uh, you work together to kind of build a world and the different players show up and play at different tables and go on different adventures and then they return to the hometown and, and that would be awesome. And I think you could do that with a world like this and there'd be material for years. Once again, you have all the deities and uh, the, the main city, uh, the city of Thatcham. I like the city of Thatcham. It's one of my favorite of his little cities, or one of his towns, I should say. Maybe that's because I detailed it the most. So this is, as I said, this was one that I did try to run for 5e, and I worked on this setting. I, I worked on the region, I made it, uh, I fleshed it out, and I you know, added my own twists on things, and I made it my own. And so I know this one the best, because I have spent the most time in it. Um, once again, you get good pieces of art for all the characters. Uh, you get some random rumors, and you get some quest hooks, and then you get High Phil itself. So this is very similar to the other ones. Now, um, the difference here is that the, the entire surface is a ruin, and so you could just kind of crawl around that ruin of the island, investigating and trying to find things, and there's random encounters you can have there, random effects you can have, a table with special encounters, a hundred different special encounters, which are all kind of cool. Um, I wish these were more common to find rather than as rare as they are. Um, parts of the island can break, uh, the, the whole thing can shift into different planes and dimensions. Um, you can go to the plane of air, earth, fire, or ice, uh, planes of shadow. You can go to the Forbidden Zone, which is the location over the, the uh, Forbidden Caverns of Archaea. Um, I think that's really, really cool. The whole thing can just shift, because it's a floating island and it, it warps and then, you know, reappears and then warps. Well, where does it go when it's warping, and what happens if it warps somewhere else for a time? So, it's got this cool idea. Um, you can restock the dungeon, and again, the, the, the restocking rules is something I didn't talk about. All the dungeons have restock rules, and how, how you would do that, and how you make them more interesting to come back to. You could really have infinite play with that if you wanted. So again, if this were a, a, a game store's open world, where, you know, you have, uh, you know, every, every Friday night, you have three tables, three DMs are going to be there playing for different adventuring groups who want to go out and you have them go into different dungeons and like there's the high fell table there's the you know the uh, barrow maze table there's the uh, archaea table and then you go to those tables and play which one you want to do that would be awesome and you could do something like that with this with this world with this big world so then you have the legend and the towers now the towers themselves there's a bunch of wizards towers and a bunch of dungeons not every tower has a dungeon beneath it but a lot of them do and the towers are cool um they are, again, pretty standard. The, the, the sorts of encounters you're going to run into are pretty standard, but these are more interesting, I would say, than either Barrow Maze or Archaea because uh, you're talking about wizards and their magical creations and different kinds of wizards focusing on different kinds of magic, and so the different dungeons and the towers associated with them are more varied. Barrow Maze has very similar kinds of encounters. You're fighting undead. Archaea, you're fighting you know hordes of creatures, and they are goblinoids and humanoids and demi-humans and, and things like that. This is like whatever you want. And if you wanted to hack your own stuff in or add your own stuff in or add in a dungeon under a wizard's tower that doesn't have one written, you could easily do it. And it would make sense. You could say like, you know, actually this wizard's tower, I want to change this guy so that he's an ice wizard. And so the entire dungeon, I'm going to theme it around ice. And you could do that. So this would be a very hackable uh, adventure. Very, really cool. I, I think this is great. The reason I like Barrow Maze more is probably because, well, two things. I think part of it is my negative association with this because of the rather disastrous campaign I ran here. I keep referring to that, but it didn't end well. I think a couple of the players still wanted to keep playing, but one of the players was just done, furious and really mad. Um, and the other player um, just didn't enjoy it. Great piece of art there. So that's part of it. I think, uh, again, part of my... Um, Part of my hesitation about this is just simply that. Part of it 
is that I think Barrow Maze does a better job of, um, oops, blocking that. Uh, Barrow Maze does a better job of um, drawing me into the actual place itself. Because this is so varied, um, and because it has this idea of the flying island, um, it makes it harder to drop it in anywhere. Now, you could easily take any of these towers and drop them in anywhere in your world. But the whole setting as a whole, I just think it's more specific. It, like a barrow under the earth, I can add into my world uh, anywhere. A flying island with an old wizard school on top of it, it's more specific, and therefore it's a little harder for me to justify putting into any world that I run, <laughs> where I can pretty much do that with barrow maze. Um, but, you know, that's kind of a silly objection, ultimately, I think. Really, probably my, my preference for Barrow Maze comes down to the fact that Barrow Maze has been successful and, and really fun every time we've run it. And and this, the, the one time I tried to run a full campaign here, it didn't end well. So probably my association with it rather than anything else. I, I wouldn't, I would do things differently now. I do want to run this again. The Ziggurats of Vol. The dungeons here are awesome. And as you've noticed, the maps are much more connected. See, here's a great piece of art with that creature from the front, front cover um, flying over the ritual circle. This is what's sort of happening in one of the dungeons in the Ziggurat of Vol, which you kind of have to stop. Right, because the dungeons are, are more varied, and because they're smaller, um, you have maps much closer to where you're actually describing the things on the map. Now, it's still not on every page, but it's, it's pretty close. And so you don't have to flip back very far to find where you're looking. There's a little, a, a lot of great incidental art, things like this at the bottom of the page, which I really like. Now, Duero Deep has that in spades. It's one of the best parts of the whole book. I'll come back to that. Uh, that's a cool dungeon. It's all circle. Um, but yeah, the, this great little incidental art at the bottom of each page, not each page, not every page, but a lot of pages, is great. Um, this book has, of course, a lot of wizards accoutrement. Uh, it has wizard's hats, it has wizard spell books, stabs. Um, and there's a lot of fun stuff you can do there. Hats do different things, you wear them differently and all that stuff. Um, and again, because you have so many different towers and therefore so many different dungeons beneath them, and they're each different flavor, they're each different in tone, um, you have so much more variety in what you're running than either Archaea. Although Archaea has a lot of variety, it's certainly much more than Barrow Maze. Barrow Maze is pretty similar throughout. But um, this is pretty much whatever you want. And again, it would be easy to take one of these dungeons and to say, okay, I'm going to theme everything in here in ice. I'm going to cover every surface in slippable ice. I'm going to make the monsters do cold damage. Uh, I'm going to give them resistance to cold. I'm going to give them, you know, uh, vulnerability to fire or something like that. It'd be very easy to do that. And then you have an ice dungeon. Or again, you do a fire or you could do it with anything else. Um, an ice elemental, speaking of which. Um, so, a lot of variety. Now, if you look at the dungeon maps themselves, let me go back to a dungeon map here. Dungeon map itself. Now, the dungeon map is, let's see if you can see that, is cool. It's got a little bit of a random hallway to nowhere vibe. And a lot of the dungeons in that, in this place, do that. Right? How do things down here get air? How do things down here get food or water? Um, how does this make any sense? And you can say a wizard did it, and in this case, it's almost, it is literally true. Um, but some players, that bothers some players. I have a player who literally, he doesn't, he gets annoyed and bothered when we do these sorts of dungeons to, to nowhere. That, you know, again, that's just a player preference and taste. Um, I think it's kind of funny. I doesn't bother me when I play it. Uh, but, but some people do. Some players do, and, and it bothers him. So if you have players like that, then this dungeon will... Or if you're like that, right, where you, you're, you want your dungeons to make all kinds of sense, then this dungeon probably won't be for you. None of, none of his dungeons really will. But this one is, is uh, you know, leaving that aside, it's a great one. So you have magic items, again, um, prepared for 5th edition. Um, lots of magic items in here because it's a wizard's school, so you need a lot of magic items. Um, which is great. Um, you have lists of new spells. 
And that's another thing that this book has, because obviously you're in a wizard school, so there's going to be more spells in here. I have some more mundane items, and then creatures. New creature entries. Lots and lots of new creature entries. Good art for much of them, many of them. I think almost every one has a good piece of art associated. Not every one, but most of them do. Um, yeah, not every not every creature has its own piece of art, but but many of them do. Most of them do. And that's awesome. <laughs> this guy. There's that worm. It's a plain worm. P L A N E, not A I N. And uh, and then we get the um, another repetition of this piece of art, which I really like. We get it again. And we get the random tables in the back of the book. And then, like every other book he's had, we have an illustration book. And that's great, because you get an illustration of each tower. So you can just show the players, hey, this is the tower you're about, you're looking at. So that they know what they're looking at, instead of just having to remember it. And then some pieces of art from the dungeons itself, and things that they can look at. All right, so Hythel. Excellent book. Um, my criticisms of it are in the 5e version, not in the Labyrinth Lord version. I think that this would be a great campaign to run in, and more so than Barrow Maze, I think your players would get, you're less likely to get tired or fatigued of the repetition in this one because it is um, so different. Because you have these wizard towers that are each so different and they have so many different varieties of monsters and, and events that can happen in them. You're, I think of all of his books, this is the one with the most variety. This Mega Dungeon is the one with the most variety. So I would, I would suggest this heartily for a campaign in and of itself. Whereas the other ones, I might... And, and this one has this quality as well. The other ones, I take more for their plug-and-play or quick pick-up-and-put-down ability. Barrow Maze is like that. I can pick it up and run some barrows and we'll have a good time. Um, Archaea, you can take a dungeon out of it and uh, and just use it. Hyphel, you can do uh, run a straight dungeon. Run, run this as a campaign very, very well, and I think it would be a good campaign. Uh, under normal circumstances. And you can also take any tower or dungeon and just put it into your world. Because they're pretty standalone, you add a little bit of flavor, add a little bit of uh, a reason why it's there, change some minor things, and you have tons of dungeons and tons of wizard's towers, old ruined wizard's towers that you can use in your own game. Now, Dwero Deep is the other book I'm going to cover today. Dwero Deep is the last of his mega dungeons. It came out this past year, I believe. Excuse me. It came out this past year, I believe. And um, it's my least favorite of the four, but not because it is, well, I, I would say it's around there with Archaea for me. I do like it a lot, and I think it's really cool in its um, Minds of Moria-ness, but it's a huge book. I mean, so first of all, let me compare these, let's show you this comparison. Here is, um, I'll, I'll put I'll, I'll put at least these three. This is this is Hyfel, Archaea, and I'm oh, sorry. And then we have Barrow Maze here. I have them all right here. Look at that. Talking in terms of its length, it's massive compared to the others. Um, so we're talking about a very big product, and much of that material is random generation of tunnels and dungeons using geomorphs and stuff like that, and I just don't like that. Like, random generation of using geomorphs and tables, I don't need a book for that stuff. So that's why I think this product as a whole is less interesting to me than the others, because a lot of it is stuff I know I will never, ever use. But the dungeons, the encounter tables, the magic items, the, the town that he builds, that's all good. I, I like all that stuff, but the geomorph stuff in the back and the fact that a lot of it is is keyed to that is just not my favorite. But the rest of the book is awesome. So first of all, the cover art is really good. You get these Dwergar, or dark dwarves in the darkness, and these two adventurers looking at the pile of loot. It reminds me of a particular old school piece of art. Um, I forget which one it is, but it, there's this... There's this picture of two adventurers entering a town and some guys waving them into an alley. If you guys know what I'm talking about, it's from, I don't know where it's from, it's from some old school book. And around the corner is this guy about to stab them. It reminds me of that. Um, I really like that. So anyway, it's Mines of Moria, basically, um, with 
all the stuff that you would expect from the Mindset Morning. Now the book is huge, as I said. Uh, the other books are, you're looking at what, it was 300 pages, just about this one is uh, massive. Now part of that is paper thickness, because these pages are much thicker. Because when all is said and done, this is only what? 320, 330 pages. So the paper is just much thicker quality. And so what that means is it doesn't bleed through as much. But as you can see, a lot of the stuff at the end, this is all geomorph stuff. I'm going to get ahead of myself, but you have these random geomorph pages. Now, this is an actual dungeon, but I'll come back to it. Okay. So, once again, it's the same as the other books. You have great art throughout. You have an introduction. You have the history of the region. You have lots and lots of text on this one. Great piece of art there. Now, what's interesting is that one of the locations here, and I don't remember which one it is. I think it's uh, there's this lost tower on a lake and one of the pieces of art relates to it in the back in the illustration book and there's no dungeon given for it. I love that. I love that because now you have a piece of art that you can use and you have a dungeon that's intended to be a dungeon but it's up to you to make it. I wish there were more things like that. Um, once again you get the town, you get, uh, this one does detail or doesn't detail but it talks about uh, Threshold which is the big city. Um, now, this is the town of Hamlet, instead of Hamlet, right? Hamlet. Um, and it talks about Threshold, which is the big city that's referenced in the other books, too. It's nearby. It's on the map in this one, on the x crawl map. Uh, but it's not detailed in a lot of, a lot of detail. Um, you have, once again, pieces of art for each of the characters. Dwarves, obviously, are a big thing here. There's this religion that relates to the Cyclops, a single eye. So they're clerics of this Cyclops. Um, really really cool now a lot of this stuff great great piece of art that's one of the things this book has it just in spades is incredible art and and as I talked about before incidental art so not just these big full page pieces but also every page after a certain point has incidental art every single one once you get to the dungeon descriptions themselves and more than that you get recurring characters it's a great piece of art that makes you want to run this, right? That's just the Mines of Moria. You see that, you're like, oh man, I gotta run this. Um, but they have the same recurring characters in all of the incidental room art. You just got Balin's Tomb or a variation of it there. These guys. And you get them going along and they, uh, they're the characters that you're seeing in every single page for the rest of the book. Uh, their adventures, what they're coming across, how they're facing the things that, and, and those are very often descript, described on the top of the page. So it's like a comic book. You just follow this, the adventures of this one particular party through Barrow Maze, or thought through Barrow Maze, excuse me, through Dwarrow Deep. Really cool. That's a brilliant idea. And I understand why more people don't do it because it's hard to do. Uh, it's very expensive. It takes a long time. It's, I mean, it would be very difficult to match up the art with the descriptions and make sure everything's working and you're commissioning each of these pieces. Um, I think there are two artists that switch off. Maybe just one artist. I think it's two at least that switch off for all of these paintings or these pieces. But it's brilliant because it puts you right in the mood and the tone of each of these adventures. You see what he's thinking. Not for every room, obviously, because it's only picturing maybe one or two rooms at most, but, but for a lot of them, for the big ones on that page. Now, another problem with this is that there are no maps anywhere except in the back of the book. So you're looking, you're just looking through pages and pages and pages of text with no maps. No indication of where you are in relation to other rooms. You have to find your own way. Okay, so this book goes backwards in that design element, but it goes forward in a lot of other ways. Um, the, the descriptions are pretty dense. And once again, you're not going to find super variety. Um, you're dealing with orcs and goblins and dark dwarves. And then you're dealing with a few areas that are much more interesting. There's certainly more variety than Barrow, May Barrow Maze. Cool troll fight. Um, depicted. But you're not dealing with, um, you're dealing with the Dwarven Old Ruin, and so it's going to be exactly what you expect. Exactly what you expect. 
Um, Archaea, you're dealing with a, a, a goblinoid demi-human horde in the ru ruins of an old alien city. So there's some, stu some stuff that you're going to see coming, other stuff that you're really not going to see coming. In Barrow Maze, it's pretty much what you'd expect. It's going to be a dark cult dealing with undead. Highfell has wizard's towers and wizard's dungeons, and so, again, a lot of variety. Barrow Deep is Dwarven Ruin, without much variation on that theme. So all the stuff that we've seen in Dwarven Rooms up to this point, you're going to see here. So it's not a lot that's new, but there's a lot of it. And uh, now one of the things that I think is a little bit less interesting to me is that this isn't as modular. So why I, it's why I'm putting it down on the list of it, because because it's a Dwarven Ruin, it's very specific what you're going to be doing there. Um, because it's all deep underground, the stuff that's not uh, Dwarven Ruins, the stuff that's like, you know, Purple Worm tunnels and things like that. Uh, Lokatha, d dwell, the dwellings, whatever they are. Lokatha, I don't know how you say them. I don't know how you say those, uh, that, that word or that name. Um, it's going to be pretty much the same. And, uh, and so what that means is you can't just easily pick this one out, at least in my experience. It doesn't seem like you can as easily take this one out and make it modular. You're going to run the, the entirety of the East Gate or the West Gate. Um, you could easily take a room out, but the rooms are often just orcs and goblins and undead. Um, so if you're looking for something that's very unique, this isn't going to be it. What this is, is the most competently, solidly designed replica of Mines of Moria for OSR that there is. But it's old school in its design, in its philosophy, and it doesn't do a lot of the things that the other books did in terms of making it easy to, to run. Uh, there's not maps. The text isn't very, very broken down very easily. The rumors that you have in town don't direct you terribly interestingly to the places you're going to go. Why are you going to be doing this entire dungeon? It's not as clear as you might have in Barrow Maze or in High Fell or in the, the, Forbidden, uh, the Forbidden Valley. Um, or the caverns, forbidden caverns, excuse me. So th this one is is my least favorite. Now, after having reviewed it again, it's my least favorite of the four. In some ways, it's awesome. The art in this book is excellent. Uh, it's cool to to look at the art books at the back. This is the tower I was talking about. There's this tower overlooking a lake, and it's a piece of art that you have in the book. I think this is also a ruined fort that you have in the book, and neither of them are detailed. So it's up to you to, to do so. I like that. I wish there were more, there were more of that. Um, a great art book. This one in particular. I love this piece. There's a, an arena under the ground that you can end up fighting in if you're not careful. Um, so, so yeah, this book is, is good, solid, just like the others. Here's the map of the hole. I wish they didn't have it on a two-page spread. I wish they had it on one vertically, but that makes sense. You break it up into two. You can print it off pretty easily. Um, and you can see the places that are detailed and and all the side tunnels. Like This would just be a hard to run. That's what I would say is that he doesn't, he presents you with a whole thing, a whole dwarven under city, an under mountain, which is crazy. Gives you a bunch of geomorphs, gives you a bunch of random tables, gives you a bunch of keyed rooms. But he doesn't make it terribly easy to run. Now, obviously, that's not necessarily his job. <laughs> I mean, it sort of is, I think, on, a, on some level. Um, but of the four, this one is just the least gripping to me. The art is really good, and I love that there's art on every page. But the execution of it is solid. It's not exciting. It's not shocking. It's not surprising. It's not modular in the same way that the other books are. Um... So, I don't feel the same compulsion to use this book. There isn't any idea that makes me go, wow, that's totally unique and I want to use that in my world. The dungeons aren't like crazy design. There's not, you know, they're, they're, they're straightforward, good dungeons. The monsters are straightforward, good monsters. But there's no idea in this that hooks me. And maybe that's just personal preference, the way that High Fell or Barrow Maze or even the Forbidden Caverns do. Um, I like the idea of this lost alien city under the Grand Canyon. 
That's a cool idea. I like the idea of a floating wizard's academy with a bunch of old wizard's towers in the sky. I like the idea of this vast network of crypts and barrows under the earth. A dwarven city that has fallen into ruin. It's cool. It's a cool idea. But there's nothing here that makes me say, I have to run this. I guess that's the difference. Um, and there isn't the sort of ease of access that makes me say, well, it might not be the most exciting dungeon I'm going to use, but it's super convenient and easy to use, the way that Barrow Maze is. Right? Barrow Maze isn't necessarily the most exciting dungeon I've ever run, but those barrows are so easy to use, and they're exciting enough and interesting enough and old school enough that I can just pick them up and put them down and, and we can play a session, uh, a random one-shot or something like that with old school characters. You can't do that, really, with Barrow Dwerody. So it doesn't have the ease of use, it doesn't have the modularity, and it, it doesn't have that sh exciting hook that the other books all do. It's why this one, and then I think a little bit like Archaea, I'm, I'm not inclined to run so much. I take stuff from Archaea. I might take stuff from this, but I, I won't really take a whole dungeon from it, and there aren't. Aside from the Geomorphs, which those are just random maps. I mean, you can find free Geomorphs online and, and put together your maps that way. Or you can find more complete dungeons online in like Dyson's, uh, Dyson Logos, you know, uh, that, are, that are free. I don't think I need a, a random section in the back on Geomorphs. So, yeah, definitely I would recommend getting them. If, again, if, if, if for nothing else, get them for the art. Because, uh, yeah, I, should, I should say get Duero Deep for the art, if for nothing else. But, you know, I think it's a solid, solid adventure, and uh, it doesn't do anything exciting, doesn't grip me, but if you feel like Dwarven City Under the Earth is a cool thing to spend a whole Mega Dungeon campaign on, and this is going to be I mean, this is, a, this is a year, two years, five years to get through this material. There's so much here. Um, this one, I think, is a must-buy. You, you, you really ought to buy Highfell, even if you're not planning on running it, because it's so modular and the ideas are so good. Duero Deep doesn't have that same draw. Get it for the completionists. Uh, get it for the um, cool art. Maybe get it in PDF form rather than buying the physical book. And certainly don't get it in 5e. <laughs> all right, that's it for this, this guys. I'll let you all go. Talk to you in another video.